are on. Thank you and welcome to everyone to the evening service. Um, hope everyone's had a great week. We're going to get the music team straight up and get straight into it. Um, absolutely, Timo. Music team, yep, yep. Worship team, I should say. There's a little bit of an echo. Um, we're going to take up the offering uh, in the second song. And um, Crystal, would you bring up the close our eyes and bow our heads and pray? Lord, we just thank you for um, what you're doing in this meeting tonight, Lord. Lord, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would move. Um, lift up the brokenhearted, Lord. Heal those people. Um, heal Crystal. She's been watching her limp all, all um, weekend, Lord. Lord, you see the desires of people's hearts. Um, there are many prayers. Lord, we ask that you would answer. You would move in the worship, Lord. Lord, that you would move um, on Gotti as he speaks tonight, Lord. Lord, we thank you, we praise you for all that you do for us. Amen. Amen. Offering in the second song. Praise the Lord at all times, and His praise shall be in my mouth. My soul will pause in His goodness. I'll not be ashamed as I look to Just cry out, and 
that will be in for some reason the last couple of days in particular I've been really just dwelling on the fact that Jesus is coming really soon when I was five I was waiting for him to come back and I'm nearly 52 and it's a lot closer now than it was back then so I think that's something that we can all rejoice in um, as times get even more and more bizarre we know that our redemption is very soon and very close There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to fill the eyes. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious The one who saved me by his grace When he takes me by the hand And leads me through the promised land What a day, glorious day that will be There'll be no sorrows there No more burden to No pain, no more parting, no more pain. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look up on his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be. Jesus I shall see when I look up on his day, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day. Oh, 
your very throne tonight, Lord. Thank you that you are here with us. Move amongst us, Lord. Thank you that you can fill us with your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you want to touch each and every one of us tonight and you want to change our hearts so that when we leave, we have heard from you, God. Thank you that you will be with us here tonight, Lord. Thank you that we can come here tonight and worship you, Lord. Thank you, God, that you are so awesome in this place, Lord. Thank you that... Our words are not even sufficient to describe how wonderful you are, God. But thank you that we can even just catch a small glimpse of that here tonight, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you. 
There's someone here who has come here with a very heavy heart, mm. and the Lord wants to lift up your spirit tonight. <clears throat> As you lift your eyes to Jesus, mm. you can feel how his presence is lifting you up, helping you to see above and beyond all the troubles and all the trials that mm. you are going through. And Jesus will be there with you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, that you've spoken to us already tonight, Lord. 
Thank you that you will continue to speak to us tonight through Gary as he shares the word and open our eyes and our hearts to see and hear what you have prepared for us, Lord. Thank you that you are here with us, Lord. Thank you that you never forsake us and you never leave us, Lord. Regardless of the darkness that surrounds us, regardless of the darkness that we may even feel in our own souls, Lord, but thank you that you reach out into that darkness, Lord, and you pull us out and you want us to turn our eyes to you, Jesus, and to just have our focus rest full on you and your wonderful face, Lord, and on the wonderful things that you have done for us and of the wonderful things that you have in store for us, Lord, in eternity. Thank you, God, that that's what you have saved us for, that eternity with you, Lord. And thank you that that day draws ever closer, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that that promise is so sure for each and every one of us. Amen. Just uh, quickly on a personal note here before Gutty gets up. Um, I remember Yoni a couple of weeks ago said at the start of the year he starts a Bible, uh, read the Bible through app and um, we found one. Have you been going through it, Yoni? Is anyone else? No, nope, just us. So, <laughs> so it's been a while since I went. I, I started going through the whole Bible and... Um, me and Crystal, every night we go through some and uh, we're getting out of Levit- Leviticus right now. Oh, my. <laughs> it has been some tough going, some tough going genealogy and, um, yeah, and it's just because we just came out of Leviticus, we're going through all the sacrificial laws and everything. Thank God we are not there anymore. If you had to be a priest back in those days, the amount of slicing, chopping, <laughs> burning of offerings, sprinkling of blood, just the smell. I always thought they'd like the Egyptian, I mean, so the Hebrews went through like the desert or something, but how do you get so much wood just to keep the burning for the offering, all the grass for the sheep, everything? There's, there's just so much there. They must be going through some pretty lush areas as well. <laughs> Um, But yeah, thank you, Jesus, that that is done away with. He's finished it, he's complete, and it has been fantastic. And um, where are we going? What book are we... Numbers. Numbers is easier, right? Is it? A little bit? No, or maybe. Okay. Um, Gutty, all yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, Keio. Um, wait till we get to Deuteronomy. That gets a bit better. Um, in all seriousness, um, the Word of God is the Word of God, and He does speak to us. Um, and some portions are a bit more difficult to get the grip of, or what He wants to say. And, um, and that's why God also uses many different people, because we all understand dimly and in part. And by his grace, we can learn more and more about his word. Um, now, I've read bits of, uh, this is not my topic, but um, you made me digress, so I'll keep digressing for a bit. Um, some old, old, I think they were written in the 1800s, um, commentary on the first five, well, the five books of Moses. I haven't read them all, um, but uh, the anointing on that and what that... Um, grace-filled author sees in all those offerings and the details and how they speak and foretell about Christ and his work and sacrifice for us. So there are, there's a lot in the Bible and um, there's a lot that we don't understand, so we press on. Amen. So welcome um, again tonight to all of us, both here and online. And... Uh, We'll get on to uh, continue our study of God's Word. As you uh, would recall, uh, the theme we've had for this month is foundations, looking at our spiritual foundations, um, and that applies uh, both to us as individuals in our daily work, walk, work, walk with God, not work, walk with God, 
Um, and also, I believe, for us as a church, and I think we do have thinking to do, and not just thinking, but praying before God that he will speak to us and continues to speak to us as a church and in individuals through his Holy Spirit. Um, about laying of foundations, we've looked at uh, the disciple of the foolish builder who built his house on the sand, which is crazy. Uh, ask the two architects here or any one of you who've been on the building trade or ask any kid who's playing with Legos. You need to attach the blocks securely, not just loosely somewhere, it just collapses. Um, and also about the looking at our foundations and looking at the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ himself um, as the cornerstone. And uh, now in this, which is really the last part of this um, January teaching from my side, is uh, still on the building theme, and that's um, a challenging topic, counting the cost uh, of building. And again, reminding us of uh, Christ as the cornerstone. That's a bit of a bridge to counting the cost um, and quite a challenge for us to look at what type of materials are we using and this really challenges us uh, really regarding our willingness to commit truly everything to Christ and are we prepared to um, pay the price. So starting with uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, a bit of background um, in the Corinthian church, um, they had all the spiritual gifts operating, etc. But it was a very divided church, and Paul was correcting them quite strongly about all these divisions in the church, which is not what God wants. And uh, in uh, the start of chapter three, he talks about, I mean, uh, you're unspiritual. Some people say that I'm, I'm for Paul. I'm for Apollos, someone's for Peter. And some smart aleck, or maybe they think they're a bit more spiritual, say, no, I'm for Christ. And then Paul asks, well, is Christ divided? And then he uh, continues, and from chapter 3, verse 5 onwards, I want to read a little bit. What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave the opportunity to, to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. And then, so then, um, he who waters is, um, neither he who waters is anything, nor the one who waters is anything, oh, sorry, start again. Neither he who plants is anything, I'm glad you noticed, nor he who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. Now then, I'm moving on. Um, according to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Everyone needs to be careful how we build on the foundation. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. We have the foundation of the apostles and prophets, i.e. God's word, the Bible. That's our true, secure, solid foundation. And praise God for that. Um, and our beacon and light in the darkness uh, help us to um, grow in our faith and to live according to God's will in this world. But Paul cautions us and the Holy Spirit through this teaching 
um, of Paul uh, that we must be careful how we build. So I threw in those cartoony pictures, ha ha. In fact, I think one of those pictures is from the three pigs who build a house. <laughs> but I didn't mind that. And we might laugh, uh, but hang on a minute. What sort of materials am I building my spiritual house from? If the big bad wolf comes and huffs and puffs, what's going to happen? And in all seriousness, as we read, the day will test. And what's that referring to? It's the day of judgment. We will be judged in eternity. And this is a different judgment for the people of God. It is not about going to heaven or hell, because we have been saved by grace. So by the grace of God, when our names are written in God's book of life, praise God, we are going to heaven. But what we are judged on is our works. And again, underlying, not our works for salvation, but our works following salvation. What sort of building materials have we been building our spiritual house from and living our lives, spiritual lives, with Jesus? In fact, it translates to our practical life, our whole holistic lives. What sort of materials is it made of? That will be tested by fire. By the grace of God, when we are saved, we will get to heaven. But if we build our houses out of straw or chaff, that will burn. All the combustible materials will burn on that day. And we have nothing left. Yes, we are through. By the grace of God, in, to his glory, eternal glory with him. But, gee, wouldn't it be nice to bring in something and in then we won't be looking at to show, hang on, I did all this. No, 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 no. If that's our attitude, that will burn. But bring something that we can give as our offering, something that will bring praise and glory to our Heavenly Father. And that will go through fire like refined gold, like even that, I think, one before the last song we were singing about. So what materials um, are we using? And the question is, are we prepared to pay the cost for the precious building materials? And what are they? And I'm not going to go into that. But are we prepared to pay the cost? Um, and this is about counting the cost in our spiritual life. Now, then I want to go to another story uh, that Jesus told, parable, in Luke chapter 14. This is another building story, and um, I'm going to take it in a couple of uh, fragments or bits, so I'll go to the story itself first, um, outside of the context, and I will come back to the context. Luke chapter 14, and reading first from verse 28, for which one of you, when he wants to build a tower does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if, has, if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. And then Jesus tells immediately after another story about a king going to war with 10,000 troops against the enemy with 20,000 troops. So will he not... Um, look at his strength and hurry to the negotiating table and try to come to some sort of a truce or agreement. But focusing on the tower builder, and some of the thoughts I'm sharing, they are not, uh, and this is for all honesty and openness, they are not all my thoughts, um, and I've used various resources as well to glean some of these thoughts and ideas. Uh, but um, like the idea of the tower, not... Now, we have to now take our mind's eye back to the time of Christ. Where were towers built normally? They were built in the corners of the walls surrounding the city, or in bigger cities, even in the middle, uh, etc., for being on the lookout against enemies and for defensive and offensive positions, shooting arrows and pouring out burning oil or whatever. Um, and they were for the benefit of the community. 
But this bloke that Jesus was talking about, he wasn't building a communal tower. He was building a tower for his own house. Now, the houses of the day um, in uh, the Middle East, they were usually the flat-topped houses. Not unlike some of the houses we saw and enjoyed in Bangladesh. I mean, they were made of modern building materials, but we came to appreciate the, the value of having a house with a flat top and with a bit of a railing so in the cool of the afternoon or early evening you could actually go there on the roof and catch a bit of wind and it was actually quite nice. And I think some people in, uh, uh, in the day also slept outside on the roof. So you don't need, what do you need a tower for? So this perhaps speaks to us about someone who was wanting to show off, show his own possessions and how he is special and is building up himself. And I'm better than you. And, you know, the proverbial, uh, if I've got a house with two bathrooms and someone else wants one with three and the next one with four, etc. If I've got two cars, the next one wants three, you know. So this one wanted to build a tower. But he was a bit nuts. He would ever do that. Um, he didn't check the bank account, whether he had money. So he couldn't get anywhere near finishing it. Now, we saw these houses or similar houses in Bangladesh, and maybe you have seen in various places if you visited. And that was actually done deliberately, so it's a bit of a bad example, but just to give you the idea. These may be two-story houses or one or two-story, even three-story houses, and they would stay at that level for years. But they had these ugly, ugly iron rods poking out from all the pillars. And that was done deliberately, because the plan was maybe to build another level or two, uh, but the money had run out at layer three, and that's how they built, uh, story by story and keep adding. So it kind of made building sense, I think, that you had the rods, the reinforcing rods ready there, so you could just tie on to that and attach and keep building until you got to the top. It doesn't look very nice and looks very unfinished, which is exactly what it was. So this guy had his uh, foundation and had the rods just stick, sticking out, so to speak. What's this teaching us? <coughs> now, after these two stories, Jesus said immediately thereafter, so then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Now that's a bit of a jump. Counting the cost, do I have enough? And then the spiritual teaching, you cannot be my disciple if you do not give up all your own possessions. And let's go back to the beginning of the section um, from verse 25. And it says that there was a large crowd, an audience, following Jesus. Now these weren't the 12 disciples or the nearest group of whatever. Uh, they were potentially... People who might be thinking that, okay, we've heard a lot about this prophet and uh, maybe he's the Messiah, maybe he's not. They were considering following him. So rather than Jesus playing to their heartstrings and um, saying, yeah, 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 come in, come in, I'll fix everything for you. He said when he, large crowds were going along with him, he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And then to illustrate that he started talking about the foolish tower builder. Now that's harsh words. That's not how you win converts, is it? But Jesus was challenging everyone, if you really want to be my disciple, are you willing to count the cost and willing to pay the price and carry our daily cross as he teaches elsewhere as well and we'll uh, talk about and carry his own cross. Now the hate, his family is a very strong term and it actually does not mean that we reject our own family. It's a comparative term. Nothing should come before Christ. In comparison to Christ, 
he comes first. We had a nice morning meeting this morning, um, not because I was pe preaching on this topic, but we had a baby dedication. And um, some of the... So we had little... I got mental block with names. Maya! I suddenly get scared and names that I should know and I suddenly get a block and then feel like a fool and I'm probably going red. It's all right. Maya. Mikael's and Erika's uh, daughter turned 10 months yesterday and they wanted to have their daughter blessed before the whole church congregation. That was lovely. And some of you were here. But then some people from the other side of um, the family who I don't know uh, where they are with their walk with God or not walking with God. And I thought, oh, no. First, we've had this lovely uh, praying over dedication of Maya and the family and uh, um, charging the parents to help them to raise their children, two beautiful daughters, to know God. And then I'm reading from the Bible, he who does not hate his family. Yeah, great. But it does not mean that we forget about our families, just in case you were wondering. Having said that, some people have had to pay dearly, even in terms of their family or leaving family behind to follow the call of God or leaving friends behind or even being kicked out of home. And worse still, and I don't want to over-dramatize, but we know it and we must remember this. We need to remember in our prayers the people who are risking their lives today and every day as they're following Jesus. And you know, in many countries, people who turn to Christ, they do so secretly in case if they were found out, their family members have a felt obligation as part of their culture and their religion to kill them because they brought shame to the family. And that has happened time and time again. And today, people are losing their lives in the service of Christ. They are carrying their cross. And Jesus has given them a heavy cross. He gives us all our daily cross, a different cross. My cross is not the same as yours, and vice versa. Part of our cross, perhaps, is to remember in our prayers so the prayers of the faithful are effective and achieve much. So I'm speaking to myself here as well. We should make a habit of praying for the suffering body of Christ, that they can be strong and be a true witness no matter what, even if it costs them their family and their home, their country and everything else. This is a tough message, but may God help us. So love for God, Christ must be greater than our love for anything else. Are we prepared to pay the price? And it requires selflessness as we submit to Christ. In Luke 14, um, well, same chapter as we read, and we read that already, but I'll repeat it again. Verse 27, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. In a similar passage, um, in fact, not the same setting, in John 12, uh, there is a, a similar teaching, but a little bit different, and I'll read a little bit, but in this case, um, I find the context interesting. This is, in fact, as Jesus is, um, for the last time, uh, approaching the time of Easter in the city of Jerusalem, just before his suffering. And um, the crowds have already um, waved uh, palm fronds and shouting Hosanna and everything else. And um, um, the king um, is coming. And then it says some Greeks wanted to see Jesus. So they spoke to Philip. And this morning I actually got the disciples wrong. I checked this afternoon. The Greeks spoke to Philip. And Philip went to speak to Andrew. And then they both went to speak to Jesus. Why they had to go such a circuitous route I don't know it doesn't matter but it's curious and then what does Jesus say and Jesus answered them saying the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified truly truly I say to you unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies 
it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. That's powerful words. Following Jesus means dying to ourselves, like the grain in the ground. And only then can the life of Jesus, God's life, come through us and shine through. And failure to devote completely to Jesus um, is like useless, tasteless salt. The last bit in uh, Luke 14 um, about the tower. After Jesus said that no one can be my disciple if he doesn't give up all his own possessions, and then he continues to say, have another short little parable. Therefore, salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless, either for the soil or for the manure pile. It's thrown out. He who, has, he who has ears, let him, let him hear. So the risk is, if we aren't completely following Christ, submitting to him, are we becoming like useless salt, which is good for nothing? I'm not preaching from high up. Um, this is a challenging message that I've been praying about it through the week that God will help me to share this um, in the right spirit of humility because I think we all have a lot to learn. And God will channel us, all of us, on a daily basis um, with these thoughts. Uh, are we willing to, am I willing to submit to Christ today? What about tomorrow? What might that mean? And indeed, um, a number of times in the New Testament and also in the book of Revelations, uh, you might recall, There's this curious statement, um, as I just read, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. There are Old Testament prophets who talk about, and God spoke to them, that by hearing they don't hear, etc. And like Jeremiah, I think, he was to prophesy to the people, and knowing full well from the beginning, they're not going to hear you but he had to declare God's word. Conversely, for us, if we have our spiritual ears open, the challenge is, do we actually hear? Or are we like the Israelites in the time of Jeremiah or Isaiah, who were so hardened in their hearts that nothing went through, as if they had no ears or no spiritual eyes? And um, God help us, um, and he will. And he wants to, and he wants to take us forward um, with his strength. I mean, we cannot do any of this on our own, so (laughs) rest assured. He has promised to be with us and give us the strength to do it. We need to give up everything to fight the battle uh, with God, but relying only on the grace and power of God. So we don't need to try to squeeze something out of us. It is by God's grace and his power that he enables us to submit to him and to count the cross and be ready to pay the price for my cross, what it looks like. Um, One of the authors I've um, sort of looked um, suggests two success factors which I think are quite pertinent for counting the cost for following Jesus in our lives. Two success factors. Um, The first one is God's approval for our plan. So if my plans aren't God's plans, they're not going to work. Simple as that. And we may not always know, so we need to seek God's face to learn his will and his plans. And then it, it can succeed. And the second success factor going with it is that we need to be working together with others in love because we are all dependent on each other. So this is not a solo recital. It's a whole orchestra together. 
um, brother Urila, he's a Finnish preacher teacher. Um, he actually wrote a few years ago, published a book, big fat one, on the parables of Jesus, a systematic study. And on this parable of the foolish builder, he uh, listed down a whole lot of wrong choices that the tower builder made. And I'm not going to read them all. You may be able, be able to read some of it. Interestingly enough, now I'm do a little digression. Um, some of the oldies here um, remember, uh, many may not, that Brother Samuel Urila actually was a pastor in this church. Well, we had the old building on Creek Road back then in the 1970s. Uh, he uh, came to Brisbane to Bible College. The Commonwealth Bible College, which is now Alpha Crucis, was in Brisbane until it got flooded in the 19, whatever, 74 floods or whatever they were. And their library got flooded, etc., etc. Then it went to Katoomba and then to Sydney. Uh, so as a Bible College student, um, Brother Samuel um, pastored this church for a little while. Um, and um, subsequently, I think, went to Sydney and then after completing all this training, etc., went back to Finland. Subse he's now in his 80s and still alive. And God has used him uh, mightily in uh, missions fields. I mean, he lives in Helsinki and part of the Salem Church there, uh, but he's been um, doing missions trip uh, teaching. He's a gifted Bible teacher uh, and really systematic um, teacher in Indonesia and um, various parts of Europe or Eastern Europe. And in fact, I think he wrote the book or had it published based on his lecture notes. And um, so that's that. Um, I was thinking of this this uh, afternoon, so I'll share a little bit. Um, just to show, uh, illustrate how the grace of God can work through families and his blessing. So I'll give you a little bit of history of um, the Finnish Pentecostal missions movement. Samuel's father was the big grandfather, Uriela, who had this crazy vision from God to get a ship, an old ship, which back then, which was in, when did Ebenezer sail off? It would have been in 1956 or seven or thereabouts. 54. Uh, when it was finally extensively repaired and made. It was actually ready to go for the scrapyard. So this crazy uh, prospective missionary, oh, he was a missionary, he had already been to China. Then God gave him this vision to get this ship, a mission ship. And it was refurbished, rebuilt. Um, his brother was a sea captain, so he joined. And a whole bunch of fresh recruits. And talk about a missions course. Among those um, on the ship, and the ship uh, was then... Uh, baptized or renamed Ebenezer and um, it was a sail ship, sailing ship with motors as well and um, all the experts said that well this ship will never get uh, past the Bay of Biscay on the western side of Europe in the storms and it'll go in the bottom of the sea. I don't know how long it survived, I think it was, it was decades mainly serving around uh, Indonesia, Ceylon or Sri Lanka, India, um, Indonesia. My wife is here because her parents were young missionaries on the ship. And um, they got engaged on the ship by special permission of the captain. <laughs> he was a tough uh, master, uh, old um, grandfather Uriela. And then um, uh, went from S Sri Lanka, Ceylon back then, and to Japan, or got married and, um, and served in mission field there their whole lives. I think Evers, parents, they were there? No. 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 Oh, okay. Close. <laughs> um, but Evers' parents were certainly part of that generation of um, uh, pioneering missionaries. And um, so there was the grandfather, Urila. Samuel Urila, uh, the pastor I've talked about, he was a little boy on the ship and actually grew up and became a mechanic and learned the mechanic trade on the ship. And um, then his brother's son, Mika Urila, was the pastor for a number of years in the Canberra church. And then subsequently, until about now, um, the Helsinki Salem Church in Finland, the biggest Pentecostal church in Finland. He's got an American wife and they are going or have just gone to America. 
So generations of God's blessing when people are prepared to pay the price. Um, the ship eventually sank um, in a storm in Indonesia and everyone who was there um, was saved and salvaged. And um, Yeah, so a lot of missionaries went through that ship um, and God works in mysterious ways. But what are the choices of us? Now we're building our own towers. Are we prepared to build God's kingdom? We may have, the second last one, noble personality, but tolerate sin. And that's not acceptable um, in God's eyes. Now, as a bit of a contrast, a total contrast, still talking about chips, by the way. I read this from a history book. I do like to read a bit of history. Um, I find it enjoyable. This has um, caught my eye a little while ago reading a book called Silk, Silk Road. It's not a Christian book by any stretch, uh, by a historian called Frankopan. And then he was talking about the road of gold. And, uh, so, um, so that's after, a little bit after Columbus discovered America. And the road of gold was established and they had you know, high hopes of extracting well, pilfering all this gold from America, and also slaves, so that's why we've got the slave chains there as well. So it was, um, it was uh, rather ugly business. And a lot of this was, by the way, done under the cross of Christ. And um, then he writes in this history book, which I thought was quite amazing and really quite startling and a good reminder for us that some missionaries and new settlers, settlers they complained of the direction of the colonization was heading. And uh, then he continued and uh, quoted someone, the point was to spread God's word rather than to make money. And then I think it was a, a priest uh, who said that, um, who had gone to America and hoping to see God's kingdom advance and not the gold road. Um, then uh, Frankopan continues and said that this was a clear echo of the protest of Christian missionaries traveling along the burgeoning trade routes and settlements of the steppes of southern Russia and Central Asia centuries earlier, who had likewise complained that fixation with trade distracted from matters of higher importance. Well, do we still have followers of Christ like that? So the gold road was in the 1500s. And these were missionaries well before that, hundreds of years before, along the Silk Road, Central Asia. What if? It's useless to play those what if games, but um, can be a little bit awakening to us. What if in the steppes of southern Russia, the vast areas of Russia, and the Silk Road of Central Asia, those countries there, what if history was different? What if? God's word had actually spread there, and that was the main priority. Not taking slaves, not finding gold, not building up trade, not building my tower. What if? What about our time? In Luke 19, Jesus again shared similar words and says, um, to everyone, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. So taking up our cross daily is to live each day uh, for Christ and not for ourselves. The cross... Um, we can understand um, this uh, illustration of when Jesus talks about taking our cross. It can be a literal cross, if not a cross cross, but we've talked about, I made reference to martyrs, paying our lives at the risk of our lives, following Jesus, shining his light. Or it can be less, perhaps severe, different, and that's <clears throat> what's been labelled disciplined self-denial. So are we prepared to live our daily lives as disciples of Christ, denying our own selves to follow him, 
Lord, let your will be done. And that can take many forms, and I'm not trying to sort of look at all the applications. I'm going to challenge us to think about that in our own daily lives as we go forward. Um, but um, this is just some of the basis. Jesus is calling for recruits, not spectators. He's not calling us to watch the tennis game, as much fun as that might be, or whatever game it is. He's looking for someone to go and play, or go to the spiritual war with him. He's looking for those people who are prepared to thread, throw their lot with him. I'm with you. I'm following you wherever it takes me. Um, Michael Wilcox, um, in, Wilcock in his um, commentary on the book of Luke, writes um, uh, or compares uh, the total commitment in following Jesus, thinking of it in the terms of the narrow gate, you know, the widest road, narrow road, narrow gate to God's kingdom. He said that the total commitment means that there is no space to squeeze through the doorway into the kingdom if we are cluttered with reservations, with ifs and buts. I'll follow you, but. And this happened in Jesus' day. I need to go and bury my father or they were fixing their nets, or do this, or do that, and I just got married, or whatever. And look, I'm not saying there are legitimate reasons, and um, uh, for, we still have responsibilities, so don't take me wrong, but what's the attitude of our hearts? Is it me first, and my building first, before God's uh, building? That's like a sack that we're trying to squeeze through the little gap in the wall ourselves, and we get stuck, we can't get through. Um, Pastor Uriela also talks um, uh, refers to the salty life uh, as one where all choices in our life are sanctified to God and are acceptable to God. That's a salty life. What does that mean for me today, you today, tomorrow? Uh, let's think about that. In a similar passage in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus talks about he who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. So if we are prepared to painfully die to ourselves, we do have a promise of a future life with Jesus. The mission of Jesus cost him, cost him dearly, it cost him his life. And he was willing to do that for us. He took his cross and died for our sins. Um, the cross carries with it rejection and shame, according to uh, Bonhoeffer. And I'll come back to Bonhoeffer in a tick, but it fits in this context. The shame we can understand. It was a shameful death and people were mocking um, but there's also rejection. Okay, Jesus was rejected by the people. Only a few of his followers, and mainly the women, were there to look uh, from a distance. But the most awful loss that Jesus suffered on the cross was the loss of his father, temporarily. When all the sin of the world was laid on him, and darkness fell on the land to really demonstrate that or illustrate that. He cried with a loud voice, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? God cannot stand sin. I may have shared this last week, but I'll share it again uh, because I think we need to remember this and let the Holy Spirit burn it into our hearts and our minds. God became sin for me. God, righteous God, cannot stand sin, cannot look at sin, cannot be anywhere near sin. He is a holy God. So he, God the Father, turned his back, as it were, to his only son, because he was sin for our sakes. My God, why have you forsaken me? And then he gave up his spirit. When that happened, there was a mighty earthquake, etc., etc., and the people who saw, they stopped mocking the Bible says that they walked away beating their chests. They knew that something significant had happened. Oh, my God. 
Praise God. Jesus raised, was raised again on the third day. As the Bible says, death could not hold him. He was the Holy One of God. He carried our sins, the punishment for our sins, but he himself had no sin. So that we can be free. Am I willing to take up my cross, which is far smaller? And I don't say this proudly or lightly, compared to what Jesus did for me. And we have a promise of eternal life with him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, some of you may have heard, or a lot of you may have heard of him. He was a German Lutheran theologian around the time of uh, the Second World War and a bit before. And he was one of the very few who started to think or oh, was speaking against what they saw happening in their society. And, they said, no. and he said, no, this isn't right. And he stood up against uh, Hitler and Nazism. And that ended up costing him his life. He was hung, I think it was just a few months before uh, the Allied victory. But he spoke a lot and he wrote a lot. Um, and I was able to get a hold of his book, Discipleship. I haven't read the whole book, but some bits of it. And it's really quite poignant and uh, quite powerful what he's saying. And when we know about the man and what he was prepared to do to follow Jesus no matter what. He says things like, the cross means being rejected and includes the shame of suffering, which is exactly what I shared about. It's suffering with uh, uh, Christ. It's taking up our cross. Our own cross is ready, assigned by God and measured to fit. Think about that. We have our own road. Well, that's a very broad, pluralistic statement. But God has our own cross for us our own cross to bear, living in self-sacrifice in service of him. And he made this interesting... Ooh, I'll come back to that. Skipped over that. Um, this interesting statement. The guarantee of distinction between theatre and church is discipleship. I'll go back to the other slide there. Um, as I was preparing this, I, I was reminded um, of um, words that I heard from David Wang, who was the director of Asian Outreach in Hong Kong decades ago. He visited Brisbane. He might have been at Main Hall at UQ, if I remember rightly, where I, much later on, did many exams. Irrelevant. Um, I can't remember what he was speaking, but he was... Um, certainly sharing about the challenge of reaching behind the bamboo curtain. And if I remember the story, or the, the gist of it roughly correctly, he was telling about a Chinese pastor that he met on a park bench and talking with him. I think the pastor had been jailed for many years. And um, I think it was the pastor who said, um, I can't remember, either one of them. But in that context of suffering, losing many years of your life in prison, for the testimony of Christ. The message, that's the gospel message of salvation, the message is free, but its delivery costs very, very much. And that really struck me, so that I still remember it. Many people are paying a very high price uh, for the delivery of the message. And this is uh, from an uh, other book that I actually just got this week um, about suffering um, in Theology of the Community, a new series. <laughs> and um, I've only read one chapter of it, and there was already a lot in there. And I wanted to extract a whole lot more, but I think that's enough quotes. This is the last one. Suffering is a bracing slap in the face that drives God's people again and again to clarify and purify the fundamental terms of acknowledgement and worship of their God. It drives us to turn our hearts to God in truer prayer. It can be a wake-up call for us. We don't like it. None of us likes suffering. 
We don't welcome it, but it is a fact of life. Jesus didn't come and promise us a life without any hardships. No, that's the false gospel. But he has promised to be with us each day, no matter what. It drives us to turn our hearts to God in true prayer. May God help us, and he will. I'll close with uh, Jesus' words in Matthew um, chapter 11, the end of it. Come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. That reminds me of what Bonhoeffer said. The cross that um, Jesus, uh, that God has prepared for each one of us, our own cross. And it is that cross that Jesus doesn't leave us to carry alone by ourselves, but he carries it with us, his yoke. Let us not take unnecessary burdens and make wrong calculations and build our own towers, but be submitted to God's will and sacrifice unto him. And he will carry us and he will help us through. God is glorified when, um, and this is not the only way, but including in suffering, and I say this, uh, with all sincerity if and when we turn in prayer to God when we are facing suffering and this is hard to do I know it from myself and with God's strength we can face the, the suffering and the struggles and that can actually bring glory to God in front of other people who see that in spite of the circumstances in spite of the hardships how can you go on it doesn't mean that we are necessarily smiling and pretending like nothing's happened, but there is that something inside us that gives us the strength to go on that glorifies God. So I'll leave you, leave us with some questions, challenges for us today. And... Um, the plan is that these questions will actually be included in, um, in the little message section in next month's program. So I want to urge us and encourage us, starting with myself, to keep thinking about these issues in the light of what we've heard and uh, as you read your own Bibles and in your own quiet times and hear from God yourselves, what are our building materials like? Are there any building materials in my life that would burn? at the day of judgment and are we prepared to pay the cost for the precious building materials like we sang about the gold and silver that only gets refined through fire and glows and glorifies God even more and what might those be and a lot of that may not be something that's visible to other people by the way it may be hidden done in secret but God sees and are there any areas in my life where Jesus does not come first? And if we are prepared to openly and honestly pray before our God and let his still, quiet voice speak to us, if we invite him, he will point to us, hey, this, have you given up that to me? Are you willing to give it up? Are we willing to pay the price? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I'm very conscious that this was a difficult word and a challenging word. And Lord, I submit it to your Holy Spirit. Um, wipe out what was from me, Lord. But you speak to us through your Holy Spirit and remind us in the days ahead and weeks ahead. Help us all to submit to your will, God, so that we can glorify you and bring you glory. And Lord, th uh, thank you for standing by us and standing with us and being with us when we are facing challenges in our walk with you. Give us the strength, like your saints of old or saints around the world and we see around us today, who can stand with you, prepared to suffer the shame um, of the cross with you, Lord. 
and you will give us the strength that we need. We cannot do it on our own. So, Lord, we thank you for being with us, and we pray to you that please, Lord, be with us. Give us the strength we need, and speak to us through your Holy Spirit, and give us spiritual ears that we are hearing, and we want to be willing to hear what you want to speak to us, Lord. And thank you for the reassurance that even if it doesn't feel like it, we know, we know, we know, we know that you are there with us, no matter what. And we bring you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Pastor Gary. Um, and just before we say goodbye to our internet friends, um, we've got a praise report that um, the Bukkanen family has um, made it safely to Papua New Guinea. So I think we prayed for that. And um, is there any other praise reports that we want to announce before we um, say goodbye to our internet friends? No? Better say hi to um, my mother-in-law. She had a 60th on the weekend. Huge, huge party. And, you know, we just had all family come to come together. And, you know, when it's all family, the praise report, it went well. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All right. um, To our internet friends, we want to say goodbye. Have a great week. Be blessed. And, yeah. It says what? See you next week. See you next week. That's it.